Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, so it's a big crowd. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, it's, I think I'm the only uh, person from academia today. So I, I'm from University, University of Sao Paulo. I just wanted to start with uh, maybe uh, mention a few groups that uh, do machine learning stuff at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, we have, I'm, I'm at the engineering school at the Butantan campus. There is uh, quite a few groups at the engineering school there. Um, from uh, looking at reinforcement learning, like my colleague here, Anna, Anna Heali, um, looking at various types of learning. There's also groups at the computer science department, which we call IMI. Uh, and then there are people, there, there's uh, quite a few people also at the east campus of the University of Sao Paulo doing machine learning stuff. And uh, also, there's a very large group, uh, I'm sure many of you know, some. So, several of you are from there, actually, in São Carlos, uh, at the computer science department in São Carlos. Um, in my lab, we have uh, uh, students working in machine learning and related uh, technologies. So here is a, a photo from a few years ago. So you, some people from this photo are actually in the audience. Um, and so we, we do some work for, uh, since uh, several years now on combining uh, knowledge that we know about things with uh, knowledge that we can extract from data. Okay, um, so what I, would, what I would like to do now is, is to mention a few projects and a few ideas. I realized that it wouldn't be really good if I were to, to tell you how to do nonlinear regression or something like this, but probably you know this about this better than I do. But I wanted to talk about some ideas that I think will pan out in the next few years, things that are happening now in the academia academic world, um, projects that we, we think are, are promising for the next few years, and I think they, they, may, they may review technologies that would be important for startups or, or, or companies, okay? I would like to talk about what, how do you combine um, data, things that you extract from data, with knowledge that you may have, okay, about some situation? How do you represent the knowledge so that it can be uh, meshed with the data that you have, okay? Um, so which language do you use to represent the knowledge so that it's, it's easily combined uh, with uh, data? And also there is, there is a push now. Um, it, this comes, of course, from the United States. There's a, a big push in, in, in the direction of explainable machine learning. How do you explain, how do you learn things that you can explain uh, so that you can explain the decisions to the user? This is what is called now explainable AI. Um, you may know there's this. Uh, there's a large project from DARPA, which is the uh, funding agency from from United States, on explainable AI, which is a very interesting project. What they're trying to do is to to um, combine data with knowledge and see if if you learn things so that you can easily explain your decisions to the user, to the end user. I think this this is uh, something that will be big in the next few years, so I would like to concentrate on these ideas. Um, so one language that is useful has been around for 20 years. I, s I hope, I suppose many of you know about this, is the language of Bayesian networks. So these are models that, that where you, you have variables, like here, for example, it's a very simple model. You're trying to model how a student will, will be graded, you know, how well a student will do in a particular course. And you, you're saying here that, that the grade depends on the difficulty of the course and the dedication of the student. It's a very simple model. But it's some knowledge that we have about the domain. We're, exp we're expressing this, this knowledge by a graph, by a structure. And now we can learn, for example, the probability of being difficult, the probability of being dedicated, the probability of having such a such a grade, given that you're, uh, you're dedicated, and so on. So this is, this is a a popular model for representing knowledge about a static situation where you have a few variables that you're interested in. Now what happens is that in many cases you have uh, patterns that are repetitive and your knowledge about things um, re are reflected in, in, in on the fact that things are, are depend on the things that are the fact that things are repetitive. Actually I try to make this as neutral as possible 
but many years ago I had a, a project with Hewlett Packard uh, where we were trying to estimate the, the probability that a computer would fail in a cluster. Now, the model of a computer was a Bayesian network, but the model of the cluster was just a bunch of Bayesian networks. All, all of them were just identical. So we, we would like to have a, a language where you can express things like this. You can express, well, this variable depends on that variable, but, but those variables are actually the same, have the same structure. Okay, so this is, this is the kind of thing that I'm looking for. Languages that can, where, where you can express your knowledge about the structure of domain, and languages that allow you to learn things from data so that the result is, is something that, that combines your knowledge with, with the data that you have. There are several languages for this. One language is called uh, the language of plates. Um, so a plate is something like this. You have variables which, which appear in yellow. And then you have these rectangles which are, which are red rectangles. They mean loops. They mean that these variables inside the, the rectangle will be replicated. So a plate like this represents a model like this, a repetitive pattern of variables. Okay? So you have a plate for the students. You replicate for the students. And you have a plate for the courses. You replicate for the courses. Quite simple. There are other languages that do the same. For example, this, this is the language of probabilistic relational models. You may have heard of this. It's, uh, it's very popular for representing situations like uh, um, uh, in, in health, for example, when you're, you're trying to estimate the, the make diagnostics for, peop for people in a population, you have repetitive patterns. Many people are using probabilistic relational models such as this to, to represent the, this, this model. So you have variables like difficulty, which are related to courses, dedication, which are related to students, and so on. Okay? So this is a different model. There are others. So I will, I will not go through all of them. Just to give you an idea, there are diagrams such as that. That, that language is called DAPER. It's a language that tries to combine entity relationship diagrams with Bayesian networks. Okay? The yellow part is a Bayesian network, and the, uh, the other part is basically an entity relationship diagram. Okay, so the question is, uh, what do you do to, to learn these things? When you have diagrams, basically the diagrams represent very large Bayesian networks. But they are sometimes hard to, to understand. So people have, have, people have tried to do, develop textual languages. Okay? One language is the language of logical Bayesian networks. This is an example where people are trying to model uh, a genetic domain. You have uh, people, a person, a person X can be a career. Um, a career is someone who carries a, a particular gene. That gene depends on the gene of the mother, the father, and whether the person is a founder or not. Or in other words, whether the person is not known to have a father, the characteristics of the father are not known. Another language that is also used for such things is the language of relational Bayesian networks. So here is another example. It's a textual language where you're trying to represent a domain where you have burglaries, alarms, uh, and people are calling other people depending on, on what happens. So there's a probability of 0.005 that a person is burglarized. And then there's a probability that a person will set the alarm depending on whether he was burg she was burglarized or not. So this is a textual representation for a Bayesian network that has repetitive patterns. Okay? Now, all these languages um, can be sort of understood as bringing together some features of programming languages you know, variables, logical variables, loops, with Bayesian networks. So we've been trying in, in my lab, with, with my students I've been doing this, uh, to combine, to create a language and to study the properties of a language that, that can combine uh, sentences, in, very simple sentences in logic with probabilities. So here is a, an example, okay? This is an example for a simple domain that is uh, expressing friendship. 
So it's saying that two people are friends. First of all, if it's the same person. So a person is a friend of him or herself. Okay? Uh, or if they are two both fans of some band or some writer or whatever. They are both fans. Or some other reason that is unspecified. And then the probability of being a fan is 0.2. The probability that a person is a fan is 0.2. And the probability that two people are related is 0.1. So you're just Given this as, as, as knowledge, in this case you have the probabilities and the relationships between fan, fanship and friendship. Okay? This represents a very large Bayesian network. If you have, for example, three people, A, B, and C, um, how do you understand this program? How do you understand this model? You, you consider the, the instance of fan for A, the instance of fan for B, and the instance of fan for C and so on for all the other combinations of friends and the variable other. And then what that model means is that there's a relationship between friends and fan. So every time uh, the, the person A appears in friends, it's because it depends on A appearing on fan. This is true for all friends and fans. And then friends depends on other. So what that program means, what that sequence of instructions mean, is that you have a very large Bayesian network of, of this kind. And in this case, you have only three people, A, B, and C. You might have many, many, many people. So that small program would become a very large Bayesian network. Now, these um, programs, these combinations of instructions and probabilities, can represent very large models. Let me give you an example. Um, suppose you're, you're studying social networks. Okay, this is something very common today. So here's a model for a very simple social network. Uh, this model says that the probability of two people being connected is 0 0.02. This is a very simple model. Okay, now if I have many people, many people are Xs and Ys, you can um, see what the consequence of this model is. It's a, it's a social network where people are connected this way. Okay? This is a social network where the connection between any two people has, ha, has probability 0.02. It's, it's highly connected network and it has this pattern of uh, not having any hubs. This is called a Gilbert style random network. Now, many of the real networks that we see in life have a different patterns. You may know this. The networks have hubs uh, and authorities. So you can code a model with hubs and authorities just writing a, a program similar, in fact, similar to this program, but you, you write a program combining in, in definitions and probabilities such that the network that you can generate is, is something like this. So here's an example of a network that you can generate a different program. So depending on the instructions that you give, you can specify things such as this or such as this. So here you have a network where you have hubs, right, connecting various nodes. So, okay, so we have a language. Okay, that's the idea. The language looks like this. And the problem is to learn these numbers. That's our, our problem. Because the idea is you have this as knowledge. You have these definitions as knowledge, as a structure that you know about your domain. And you have to learn the numbers. OK? So this is one problem. The second problem is you may not have the definitions. You may have data, and you may be interested in learning the definitions themselves. So these are the two kinds of problems that we're interested in. So let me give you an example of an application. Um, so we, we wrote a program a few years ago where the idea was to learn um, rules uh, that control the connection between researchers in Brazil, analyzing data in the Lattice curriculum, which you may know, some, I guess many of you know. So you have all these data about researchers, who publishes what, and who is co-author of whom. Okay, and we, we wrote a program that mines that, uh, that database and brings up 
uh, discovers rules about researchers. And these are two examples. Here, here's, a, here's something that the program found that it is simple. Two people share a publication in probability 0.22. And here's another rule that is not so simple. is A person is a research faculty if, it's, if she's a faculty and an advisor. So this was sort of mined from the lattice uh, data set. Okay? The challenge in doing this sort of thing is, of course, to control the search for rules, because there are too many possible rules. And of course, you have these big databases of facts that have to be mined. So the, the, uh, the challenge was to control the search so that we could get sensible results such as this. Um, we actually use this. Uh, th this sort of system was part of a recommendation system, a project we did, we did with Puscapé a few years ago. Uh, and now we're doing something uh, similar to this, but with the World Health Organization, um, to build models of social networks in poor, pe poor areas so that people can predict how uh, people will get sick in these poor areas based on the context that they have. So this is one example of things we're trying to do. Here's another example. Uh, there is another language uh, which is very similar to the language that I've been discussing with you. It's called Problog. Okay? Problog is the language, of, I guess, I hope you can see this, where you have rules, just as before, and you have probabilities attached to rules. Okay? And so the challenge is, again, to learn the rules. And once you have the rules, maybe you have the rules because you have knowledge about the domain. You, have, you, you read, write the rules. Once you have the rules, the, the challenge is to learn the probability of the rules, the numbers. Okay? And you can get this, the probabilities by um, getting data. So we, there are uh, several algorithms, several systems that learn these rules from, from knowledge bases. Um, some very big knowledge bases have been built. You may have heard of Freebase, Nell, Yago. And so there are programs that mine these this data sets to build rules. The problem is these programs today are very uh, are not scalable at all. Uh, this program, for example, is the state of the art. It takes hours to mine a very small portion of the now data set, which is very small. So we're trying to make this scalable and, and make this uh, rule mining um, algorithms uh, able to, to learn from very big data sets. We actually have a project from, uh, funded by FAPESP IBM. Right now, it's a, it's a PT project. And the ob objective, the main goal of the project is actually to make these things scalable so that it can, they can be applied to large knowledge graphs, knowledge bases. Um, we've been doing this for a few months. We're, we're getting very big improvements on speed compared to Problog. And this, our goal is to get this to a point where it can be applied to very big data sets. OK? so. Um, what's the goal here? What's the idea that we're trying to, to, to sell, okay, to, to defend? Is that you have all these uh, techniques from machine learning that are sort of um, not very well. Like you learn, but you don't know exactly the structure that you're learning. So things are not really well easy to explain. So you, for example, you, you take a neural network, a deep neural network, and learn from a set of images. It may be that you cannot explain very well what happened. It's just making a decision on what's in the, in the image. Okay? So you have, for example, a deep neural network processing data. You have some nonlinear regression processing data. But then when you want to make a decision, you, you, you want to explain to the end, end user, why is it that you're making a decision? In other words, you, can, you, you want to make your decision explainable to the end user. Okay? So our goal is to, have, is to build this upper level, okay? which may be getting information from classifiers, neural networks, regress, regressors, but which is, which is taking a, making a decision in a way that is based on rules and things that can be explained. So that's, that's the, the broad overview of the, the project. So let, let me then finish, I'm just finishing, uh, by saying a few things about uh, an effort that we are trying to build at the Universidade de São Paulo. We're, we, have, we have many groups, as I mentioned the, the first uh, minute of my talk, and we're trying to put people together uh, in a center, 
we have already space, a very nice uh, space in the building, new building in the universidad, university. Um, and we're trying to, to put together a workshop, which I hope will be as successful as this one in bringing people to discuss how to make a connection with industry, a connection between industry and, and academia that is uh, useful for everyone. Okay, so I hope if this workshop happens, I hope all of you will be there. Okay. Um, so basically what I try to do here is to make a, this very brief review of our efforts in putting together probabilities and, and knowledge when doing learning. And also an invitation for you to join us in putting together this Center for Machine Learning, which is something I hope will happen in the second semester. Thanks a lot. Thank you.